Coming up on DTNS, spoiler, we're going to tell you everything that's going to happen in 2022. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Friday, December 31st, and for the last time, 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Roger Shang, the show's producer. It is time for our annual prediction show. We're going to make our best estimates of what we think is going to happen in the tech world in 2022. And to join us making these predictions is Shannon Morse. Welcome, Shannon. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Nika Monford, thank you for joining hello. us. Hello, glad to be back. And Stephanie Humphrey, thanks for being here. Always a pleasure to be here. Happy New Year, everybody. Almost, Tom. Almost. Happy New Year. It's close enough, right? <laughs> Jump in the gun, yeah. just a smidge. Yeah, yeah. I am ready for 2022. Can I even I bet tell you? Are. you? Yeah. yeah, I think we all are. Uh, it's, well, like, it's like you would say it can't get any worse, but then you'll jinx yeah, it. You know, it's yeah. way, way worse. Right? It's way worse. Yeah, it's just, I said way that worse. 2019. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, let's get into our predictions and uh, break the ice. Sarah is going to start us off. We each have three predictions for 2022. And as is tradition, we will all try to gather at the end of the year to evaluate how we did, just like we did for the 2021 predictions. Uh, but Sarah, what is the first of your three? All right. So the first of my three, I feel pretty confident about this one. Um, I am not an Apple Fitness Plus subscriber. And the reason is because I don't have an Apple Watch. But... I've been thinking about this a lot and I love fitness, VR, everything. Uh, and I, you know, I, I do plenty of that on the Oculus Quest. I'm sorry, the MetaQuest. And I think that when Apple announces a VR headset uh, early in 2022, which I believe it will do, even though we're not expected to see shipments until later in the year, I think that the company is going to make it a big Fitness Plus tie-in. I think that it will be, yeah, I mean, VR, AR, you know, fine, great, but we're going to make you healthier, and here's how we're going to do it. I don't know a lot of people who uh, use uh, Apple's Fitness Plus on a regular basis. I know they're out there. I actually do. Okay. All right. And Here I love you go. it. Yeah. And a VR so, tie-in would be great. Yeah, so that that's 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 where I feel like Apple's going with this because Apple always wants to, you know, for better or for worse, Apple is, you know always has our best interest in mind. <laughs> Apple wants you to be as healthy as possible, and here's how Apple is going to help you be healthier. And I think that this is just a perfect marriage of the two things. I'd buy it. Will you? Will you actually buy it? A price point we'll have to see. I, you know, I it, it's it's rumored that 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 heads is going to be you know exponentially more expensive than than what uh, Oculus is looking at right now. So price is going to be a big factor. Yeah, I I think the fitness tie-in makes sense. I think that's uh, I think that's that's super smart. There might even be sensors in there. But if yeah, there's anyone listening, yeah. needs to send me one. And, and, and for anybody who's sort of like, ah, VR headsets and fitness, it's, you know, I am, I'm a big proponent of this, a lot of fun, but there are only so many things that you can do with at least, you know, the, the quest, which is what I'm using because you can't see the outside world. You know, you can, you can do a variety of exercises, but yoga would be weird, for example, you know, cause you kind of got to look at your own body type thing. And I feel like Apple well, I hope Apple is going to tackle some of those things to be able to then sell you on their subscription models. I'd be All down right. for it. All right. We got Nika on board. Shannon? Oh, you know I'm all Android centric. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Shannon's like, who cares? Stupid Apple. <laughs> You're, she's like, you guys enjoy it. It's fine. <laughs> well, maybe everybody could get on board with this. I know this is a shot in the dark, and I don't even know if it's a shot in the dark because I'm not even saying that I want this to happen, but Elon Musk, everybody's familiar with him. Uh, he's a uh, he's, he's quite a character on Twitter um, and quite a character in the crypto universe. I feel like maybe in 2022, something's going to happen, and he will be forced to step down as the CEO of Tesla. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Could I have be. no insider knowledge about this. Be, to be clear, I just feel like things are getting weird enough that it could happen. 
<laughs> do you think it's more kind of similar to Jack Dorsey stepping down to focus more on square slash block? Or do you think he's going to be forced to be like, you know, well, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it could be as something as simple as him saying, I really just care about going to Mars. So the Tesla stuff, I'm going to I'm going to let somebody else handle the day to day. Or it could be something a little bit more dramatic. I guess I'm not sure about that part, but I feel like I feel like it could happen. I see him getting forced out. I don't see his ego allowing him to just walk away from Tesla at at this point. Um, but he, I think he's done enough that there could be a case to be made to to get him out of there from, you know, shareholders or whoever. Um, the the federal government or somebody. Um, but yeah, I see him being forced out. He has a lot of heat on him right now in a couple of different spaces. So, yeah. 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 I'm honestly just... kind of surprised that it hasn't happened yet. But <laughs> given like all the things that have put him in headlines for such a long time, I won't make any specific uh, notices there, but uh, it, I could see it happening. I could definitely see it happening, but not by his choice. Maybe it's hmm. a little both, right? Like he gets in hot water with a misstep and then says, you know, I've decided I'm oh, going to yeah. focus on bars. They're not forcing <laughs> me out. Yeah, yeah. That's sure definitely a bond brand with yeah. his ego. Yeah. 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 And then we'll all come back to the show and say, see, see what we told you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my my third prediction, this one is a little bit, I try, I, I want to make this as concise as possible, even though I don't think it's a very concise topic, but NFTs. I don't own a, one NFT. I know a lot of people who uh, participate um, and, uh, you know, kind of go through that, like, it's like that sneakerhead thing where it's like, the drop is coming at 9 p.m., got to get that, like... I don't know which NFT kind of thing. And I just can't keep up with that stuff. But I've heard enough rumblings around town about how enough people also don't understand NFTs that I don't really understand what the second market is. So let's say that they're, uh, what was it? Oh my gosh, they were, um, I forget the name of the NFT, the Flower Girls. Anybody remember the Flower Girl NFTs? It was like last week, very recently. And it was a big deal in certain circles. And it was, you know, being pushed by lots of people online. Oh, you got to get the Flower Girl NFT. And, and a few people I knew uh, uh, got some. But I'm like, okay, well, the whole idea is that they will, uh, you know, th their value will increase. But where where's the second market? Mm. I feel like if you didn't participate in that first wave... You don't care, and where, where are you going to sell these things? So exactly. I just, I just kind of, I feel like NFTs might have a little bit of a slump. Ask all of those people who still have Beanie Babies in their house mm -hmm. in the in the basement yeah. right now that said this is a rare one and it's going to be worth something in ten years or twenty years. <laughs> I think that's, I think we're going to see a similar situation with with some of these M NFT folks. Yeah, I, and I'm I think one it's, of those weird. I'm one of those weirdos that collects things and has like an entire room of collector pieces. But my stuff is like physical retail products that you can physically purchase and have in, in a household, not digital things. So I can understand from like a collector mindset of like, I collect NFs, NFTs to keep them and to share them, like to tell people about my collection. But I'm of the same mind space of like, where is that second market? Like, would they be able to sell it afterwards? And I think the whole NFT situation, it was one of my alternate predictions that I, I passed on. Um, it's one of those things where you get it in the hopes that it becomes something similar back to the dot-com era where yeah. if you're buying, you know, Google or Microsoft, you hope that, you know, 15 years down the line that you're, you're in it early. So it, you can make, you can make a lot of money from it, but it's one of those things where you just don't know where it's going to go. So you put this money up front, hoping that it gives you a big yield, but you, you just don't know. And it's so many people getting in it. And it's because, you know, you buy it with crypto and crypto is really hot right now. So I think it's just kind of like a, 
like a pile of just yeah it's like a it's like a fake a fake gold rush a pay and wait type thing yeah that i mean and and i get that i i would buy something even that i couldn't afford if somebody was like it's gonna be 2x value a year from now like that sounds great yeah but i just don't i don't know who who are the people who are gonna get on this this wave later on uh and i could be wrong but that's my prediction I think where you'll end up being right is that NFTs will be like like dot com addresses where they'll be like, oh yeah, I mean we use them, but they weren't an investment; they're just a tool, you know. Right. Yeah, I think I think I think you might I think you might be onto this one. All right, Stephanie, your turn on the dais. Alrighty, Start alrighty. Start with the first of your three. What do you got? Um, I think we are going to see another catastrophic AWS outage. Unfortunately, I don't. I absolutely don't want to be right about this. But considering we've had two in in less than a week already, um, and and not even just the fact that we've had two, I think it's because uh, Amazon has been so vague and non-transparent about what is actually happening and why. Um, I I I I just I don't. I feel like it's coming. Something something big is coming where it's going to be a more dire and drastic situation than I can't log on to Twitch right now. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I, I like I said, I don't want to be sort of this doomsday person, but um, I, I think it's going to take, unfortunately, something drastic and dire to happen before we, you know, really get serious about what safeguards need to be in place and 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 what type of transparency needs to happen when when this type of thing goes down. Because, you know, it's like all of your, you know, systems failed, but then the systems that were supposed to catch it failed. And then it's like that, you know, that that lack of 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 um, reliable redundancy is is concerning and troubling to me. And it's just they're not telling us enough right now. So I, I feel like, you know, when you don't learn from your mistakes, you're you're bound to repeat them. Yeah. And I think kind of on that, it's one of those things where it could even be some sort of cyber attack. I mean, we've seen how just taking down one region, how it affected some huge platforms for seven hours and seven hours in digital time is, you know, almost a lifetime. So it's one of those things. I think what this last outage showed us is that you can kind of, if you're a bad actor, you can kind of slide in there and, and do some significant damage to a lot of people. hundred yeah. percent. I mean, we, we've seen attacks like that happen so many times, uh, especially in the past couple of years. I mean, y'all remember the when the um, refineries shut down or the oil yeah. Uh, yeah. oil systems, the pipeline? The yeah, that was yeah, crazy yeah. as well. So, like, I, I can imagine that we'll definitely see another AWS outage next year. And, yeah, I 100% think it will be worse than yeah. the one that we just saw. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's not even worth it. And then it actually was three um, and not two. There was another, they called it an aftershock on the 10th um, after the one on the 7th. So, mm-hmm. you know, it just, yeah. We're, wow. It, wow. It, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, and, I, like I said, if, I hope I'm not right, but I, I don't, I think I will be. I think you're right. <laughs> if, uh, if between the time we time traveled to December 31st and the time we recorded <laughs> this, another one happens, Stephanie means even another one on top of that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Build that in. A- to the, another, another one. As I of know. December 31st. <laughs> I think, you know, the AWS stuff is, I mean, it obviously cripples companies uh, and, but of course, consumers, uh, you know, as the end user, are like, yeah, well, I can't do anything, you know, with these companies that have to be up and running. And if they use AWS, I can't do my job. I think I think the whole idea of like the catastrophic part of this is, okay, what what are we going to see next where something goes down to the point where people die? Um, well, that's you know, the thing. You, you talk about the hospitals that might be connected to, to this system that, you know, every... A uh, heart monitor in the hospital goes down at, at the same time, or you know, ventilator or or something. So that that's what I mean by catastrophic. I mean, I didn't want to just say people are people are gonna die. I didn't want to you know be that doom and gloom person, but but that's what I mean by catastrophic is the idea yeah. that that we are going to lose lives um, because of the next one if we don't kind of get it together. I'm gonna choose to be hopeful 
Uh, and uh, this doesn't mean you will be wrong, but I'm going to to choose to say Stephanie will be wrong and just like cross my fingers. Listen, say, I'm right with I you. hope when we're talking I'm, about I'm this, saying at a the prayer end of the year, as we speak, that you get to be wrong. I think you'll be happy if you're wrong. The one I thing I will say that. is, you may, if if you are wrong, you may be wrong about AWS, but not wrong about something else. There may be yeah. another cloud related outage. Outage. Uh, yeah. I think it's that's true. certainly likely. Yeah, yeah. All right. What's prediction number two? Well, it's funny, it, as it turns out, I, I was clairvoyant about this because it's already <laughs> happened. Um, I predicted that a couple would get married in the metaverse and it happened a couple days ago. Um, but I think it speaks to a larger idea of um, relationships in the metaverse. You know, we already see Tinder talking about the Tinderverse um, and the CEO of the Match Group has already built what they call single town. Um, and they're testing it in South Korea right now so they can, get together and hook up or whatever. And um, Planet Theta is, is a VR dating app. So it's it's going to be really interesting to see what happens um, with dating in the metaverse next year. Maybe we'll see our first metaverse divorce next year or, you know, people or people are going to start buying digital real estate together because they're already doing that. So now we'll be buying these homes together um, in that space. So I, I think the way we relate to each other is going to change dramatically and not necessarily in a good way. I mean, I think this could be helpful for people who who may have social anxieties and different things like that, but it's going to make us even more disconnected than ever, I think. I, I don't think it's going to help. I, you know, I mean, as as a single person who, you know, has, has definitely uh, dipped her toe in the dating apps, I mean, the whole thing about dating apps is sort of like, okay, you get pictures, maybe video, certainly some texts, but yeah, you're not somewhere with someone ever until you're physically somewhere with that person right. you know and that may happen that may never happen the metaverse i mean and i'm trying to you know put a nice glossy glow on this like this could be kind of fun um i'm not sure how much it's going to lead to long lasting relationships that translate to the real world but, you know, talking about things like, you know, marriage or divorce or, you know, kind of big stuff, the more that that stuff happens in the metaverse and you don't do it in the real verse. Uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of scares me. Yeah. And 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 again, I hate that all my predictions are like super Debbie Downer negative, you know, worst case scenario. <laughs> but when you when you extrapolate that to worst case scenario, the first sexual assault in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that look like? It 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 just it it would be as traumatizing as real life, but you know, the person does the person get to get away with it because yeah. it's virtual and not real and you know, so it's well, and it, it's supposed to it's be all as real as possible, right? So you could never say to somebody, Well, it's just the metaverse, didn't really right. happen. It, it, it was yeah. only oh. virtual. Yeah, the, that that person's trauma is gonna be real in their brain forever. So I, you know, since we've already seen that marriage, if if these dating apps sort of take off and running next year without really considering all of the ramifications, I think we may see that. Um, Technology next. Review had an article about groping in the the horizon, uh, Meta's oh. horizon already. So really? that you're, you're, you're you know, sadly right on, right on target with that. Yeah. Again, I want to be wrong about that one as well. Um, my third <laughs> one uh, in 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 uh, in the vein of Sarah's prediction, Apple is finally going to do something that makes us care about VR. Um, I don't know, no disrespect, no shade to anybody that actually cares about VR right now, um, but I don't think enough people care. But I think Apple is going to be the company that does it. Maybe not necessarily with the headset, with the headset but they are rumored to have some glasses coming in 2023. Um, and I think that's gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make VR happen, just like we're gonna make Fetch happen. <laughs> Finally, Finally <laughs> Fetch. Apple will make Fetch happen. <laughs> it's never gonna happen. Okay. Never you know gonna happen. Gonna, you know it's never gonna happen. Stop trying to make <laughs> VR happen. No, no but I, yeah, I, I think I'm, be I'm with you on this one, Stephanie. I mean, obviously, I, 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 I'm a, I'm a VR enthusiast, but I also think that it's really limited right now. Mm -hmm. And the more folks who can, can, can get into the VR uh, universe on whatever app that you know was most fun for them or where they connect with friends and metaverse you know put that aside for a second you know yeah. a lot of this is like 
playing games or being productive and maybe having a, a virtual workspace. I mean, all of that stuff is so in its infancy that I think, you know, Apple, Apple is often not the first company to, to come to product, but they're the company that convinces everybody that they've exactly. figured out the product. Exactly. And and I and I think they will do a better job of it than than Facebook and or Meta has done with Oculus so far. Just as far as aesthetically, stylistically, you know, making and the it cool factor. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Making it something people actually want to put on their heads. I think I think they're going to do a great job um with design on yeah. on their headset. And Nika, I mean as a as an Apple enthusiast, um I mean how how excited are you about what seems like it's probably going to happen next year? I'm here for it. I'm I'm in line. I'm ready to <laughs> to get into she has it. Sleep the bag ready. <laughs> Yeah, my out. virtual, <laughs> my sleeping bag in the metaverse, waiting outside <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the virtual Apple store. <laughs> that that, that kind of takes us right into the the first of your predictions, I think, doesn't it, Nika? Right. So we're going to keep on the Sarah and Stephanie train. I'm calling it the triple A's: affordability, availability, and adoption of AR VR hardware. I think. Now we've seen Oculus, we've seen how it has some popularity. It's a small block of people that use it, but now that Apple is getting into it, I think there are going to be more companies who may be kind of in the background, not wanting to show their hand too much because when you're going up against a Meta or an Apple, you may not want to show too much, but I think it's really going to be one of those things that really comes into its own in the next year. And I'm thinking specifically on the edge of we're still in a pandemic. I think we're still going to be in the pandemic well into 2022 and beyond. And we've seen, I think, with like the NBA, when they had kind of folks in the virtual stands, you know, watching the game and they kind of had their image popping up. I think we're going to start to see the introduction of in-person events through your AR, VR hardware, whether it's a headset, whether it's glasses. So I think it's going to start a multi-stream of in-person and virtual mm -hmm. events at the same time. You'll probably have a higher upcharge maybe to be on the augmented side than actually in-person, but I think they're going to start to merge the in-person with the virtual. So it's mm. kind of a cohesive type of experience where whether you're at home or whether you're actually in the venue, you're experiencing the same thing, just maybe in you know different mediums. That's a great application. Although I hope they don't do that before March 31st because I just bought tickets to New Edition today. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to see it in person. I, I don't care. I'm going. <laughs> well, but I mean, I think, you know, Nika, I think your point is you see it in person. I mean, nothing can replicate that. But watching it on, I don't know, a television is also fine. But the VR aspect gets mm -hmm. you a lot closer to that in-person mm -hmm. experience, whether or not Absolutely. you can go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. that'd be a great application for it. That that would be something that would make me buy a VR headset. Like mm -hmm. just the I, ability, I having idea. the ability to do that would 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 make me buy. Yeah, I think last we're year, coming there. Last year, I was going to go see a musical in San Francisco, and it got canceled because of the pandemic. And it would be so cool to be able to sit in the audience virtually mm -hmm. and still be able to watch a live live show of a musical with all the different casting characters. Like that would be incredible. Especially if and I could I'm, get like some kind of really nice sound with like yeah. Dolby. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, I would totally pay tickets for tickets for and that. And I think, you know, people are going to miss out on a lot of money if they don't get on this because there are going to be people who want to be in person. And there are people who, since we've been in this pandemic, they're like, I'm not here for that. But mm -hmm. that's money on the table that they're missing if they don't cater to the audience as well. Yeah. I like that so idea. I, I love that yeah, idea. I, yeah. I actually, now I'm excited. Now I want like uh twice is coming in, in, <laughs> at the LA and I'm like oh we could see both shows go in person one day and then go virtual yeah. for the second yeah show, right yeah, yeah yeah all right what's number two Nika 
Number two is crypto goes mainstream. I think a lot more countries are going to be accepting of crypto. I think a lot of businesses are going to be accepting. I think, who is it, Odell Beckham, I think his entire NFL salary is now in Bitcoin. I think it's going to be one of those things where everyone's talking about it. People are trying to figure out what it is. And I think the learning curve definitely this year, maybe going into the top of next year, but I think if businesses are smart, which I think they have smart people who want to make money, they're going to start to say, hey, there are a lot of people who have tons of money in their digital wallets. They just need a way to spend it on things that are available. So you know what? Let's go and get some of this money that's out there just sitting and waiting for people to try and figure out how to get it out to buy something, but then keep it in. So I think we are going to see a surge of cryptocurrency being available in a ton of different markets. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. I was, I was listening to an economist, uh, podcast interview, uh, not too long ago. And one of the heads of, I think Binance was saying he has gone from apologizing if he asked if somebody took cryptocurrency to being surprised when they won't. Now mm -hmm. this guy's super rich. He's not going to Ralph's and trying to use <laughs> cryptocurrency. He's like buying fine art or whatever, but, right. but you know, that's, it, it, it does tend to like percolate through from that sort of thing. So I, I think this one's pretty good. I think, I think you're right. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a slam dunk. Yep. And my last one, I think in the age of climate change, we're all talking about, we're seeing what's happening with the environment around. I think EVs, electric vehicles are going to become the norm. I think they're going to be pushed to the forefront. Pretty much every major car company has an EV line coming out. A lot of people have gotten on this 2030, you know, train. I think people are going to be able to more easily have access to an EV before. It seemed like an elusive kind of, you have to be on a certain, you know, pay scale to be able to get access to it. And then when you think about it as well, how people's concerns are, how am I going to charge this thing? If I'm driving, you know, 300 miles to go visit someone, am I going to be able to get back home on that same charge? So I think we're going to start to see the implementation and the availability of EVs and the supporting uh, hardware that goes along mm -hmm. with it. Honestly, Nika, I, <laughs> I am right in the market for this prediction. Um, my, uh, my current lease, I have a leased car is up in March. And I'm seriously considering an EV, but I want to, I want to make sure like, okay, well, how far would I go before mm -hmm. I'd have to get back home and it could become a problem? Mm -hmm. And honestly, I mean, the options are better than ever. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel as scared as I felt, you know, five years ago thinking like, oh gosh, if I get a, you know, some the uh, model three, like I'll, uh, you know, what if I can't find the charging station, you know, out on the uh, freeway somewhere? Yeah. I think it's, I think we're, we're getting there. Yeah. And I think it's going to be more universal because right now for specific brands, you have to have a certain type of charging station. I think we're going to get to the point where it's going to be maybe a federal standard type of charging station or some sort of regulation where if you're going to have this EV, you have to have it where it's accessible to be able to be charged with a standardized type of charging adapter kind of thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, that that would be awesome if we had like USB-C, but for EVs. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's going to happen. I, I don't I, I wonder about next year. I think maybe we're looking at 2023 or 2024 for this because I just don't I still don't see and I could be just me not seeing it, but I still don't see that mid range, that mid price range EV. I see, you know, Priuses and Volts on the low end and Leafs. And then I see, you know, Teslas and, and, and Porsches on the high end. I, you know, there, I know there are like, especially with trucks, a lot of truck, a lot of EV trucks coming out right now, but I still don't see that, that one 
um, like like that Ford Explorer mm -hmm. for EVs. You know what I mean? Like, what's that one vehicle and one brand that's going to be, you know, become that ubiquitous, like the Camry of of EVs, basically. Exactly. Like, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't see that yet. Um, so I think we still might need a little bit more time, but definitely as soon as they get that charging station thing worked out um, and get some sort of standardization around that, it's it's going to blow up. All right. Those are good predictions. Let's see what Shannon's got. Start with your first one. All right. Nothing about VR on my end. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't uh, know. Yeah, I stuck with Android type of uh, predictions. The first one is Google will release a Wear OS smartwatch, which we've kind of heard rumors about. But my turn on it is that they will build it with their own hardware, such as using Tensor and or their Titan M2 chipsets mm -hmm. for security and privacy in the Wear OS, as well as um, the strength of Google Assistant and bringing that kind of AI to a smartwatch as opposed to just in Android or in home smart home devices. What do you think happens with, you know, the Fitbit acquisition? You know, if that sort of thing happens, yeah. are they just two different markets? I am, you know, I am kind of curious about that because I, I saw that they acquired Fitbit and I'm wondering if they are going to take like the software side of Fitbit and use that to build into their own smartwatch. That's what my thought process would be. Like, I like still think they're feature. going to be using like the Fitbit fitness application, but just bringing in a lot of those features and a lot of that software, um, a lot of the app technology into their own hardware. And does this work with every Android phone or or, or, or is this just going to be for, you just see this for Pixel users exclusively? Because, you know, Samsung, That's L a good question. You know, HTE, all, all <laughs> yeah. the other ones, OnePlus, is, does this work for all of yeah. them? Well, one of the nice things that we've seen about Android is uh, ev uh, as they introduce like new Android operating systems, eventually it does come to the other manufacturers and brands as well. So maybe not at the front and center. I don't think that they will release the same kind of applications to all of the brands and all the different manufacturers of Android uh, uh, phones. But I think that eventually it would get downstream to all the other brands, but it would start on the Pixel line. Yeah, Pixel always have a couple more features maybe than the other ones. They mm. always do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's number two? Uh, number two is in late 2022, I think we will see Google start to tease their first foldable Android phone, but this is not actually going to release until 2023. Um, part of the reason why I think that it would be, well, we've already known that they have not confirmed a foldable in any sense of the word, even though there have been plenty of rumors. Uh, we also know that they have had a lot of chip shortages, especially leading to delays in the most recent Pixel lines. And I think that that is going to continue into 2022, seeing all those kind of shortages and delays in shipments and in manufacturing. Um, I believe that they are working on some kind of foldable implementation, but we won't actually start to see them officially tease it until the end of the year. And I think that will end up making a foldable like the Pixel 8 line or Pixel 9, maybe a Pixel 7a. I don't know. We'll see. But I think that we'll actually get a release of a foldable in 2023. Pixel F. Yeah, Pixel F. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the Pixel F. <laughs> I mean, we talk so much about foldable phones and, uh, you know, so many companies are, you know, coming out with foldable phones and you get the reviewers who say so great in all of these ways, but so not quite ready in all of these ways. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I want that foldable phone where it just makes sense to have a, you know, phone slash tablet that's all in one in your pocket. Yeah, and part of this is from my like my own wish list of having a Galaxy Z Fold 3, but having the Google uh, Assistant and Google AI built into it and all of the like beauty that comes with a Pixel mm. and like the cameras that are built into the Pixel, except with the super fun Samsung foldable. So I think that would be amazing, but we, we don't have it yet. And I'm just really hoping that Google is listening to their audience. 
I still feel like foldable phones are m- trying to make fetch happen. Again, I'm throwing, I'm throwing <laughs> I'm with there you, with VR. Steph. I'm like, why are we, tra- why, why are we even trying to make this happen? That's the one thing I, like, I, I, I'm not a person that carries around a big phone and, 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 and engages with my phone in that way. So, you know, maybe I, I clearly I'm not the target uh, market. I mean, I, I remember my razor. I loved my razor, you oh, know, yes. with, with all of my the life. Razor. Um, but, but I don't want another phone like that. (laughs) Like I just, (laughs) I, I I don't see, you know, I, I just don't see the use case that is going to make these, um, more than a, than a niche product. So Mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, I'll, I'll be curious to say, look at this, look at this. Clearly I am in the the minority. I am clearly in the minority, but I'm just like, why? What are, what? You're not though. You're not in the minority at all. It's definitely a very target market. Yeah, I'm very much with you because personally, I'm thinking foldable is a misnomenclature. It's more a flip in my mind. I'm thinking Mm -hmm. when I think foldable, I'm thinking something more malleable, not necessarily maybe something with a hinge, but, you know, actually like fold over. And when I see some of these, and I'm glad that Samsung calls theirs a flip, because to me, that's really what it is. When I think foldable, I'm not sure if you guys watch this, but the show, I can't remember what uh, channel it was on, but Extent with, I think, Halle Berry. And when they had their communication devices, they were truly like foldable, kind of like, see, when I think of foldable, you know, that's where my mind goes, not necessarily yeah. flip because we've had kind of like the flip, you know, kind mm-hmm. of deal. And, and again, I had a razor. I love that phone. Like I said, I still have it because I still have two of mine. <laughs> yeah. So I, in, in my mind, when I think foldable, I think more, I think less kind of hard, like click kind of mm-hmm. flip open and more of like a softer type of more malleable, you know, type of device, but that's just kind They're of so where my mind goes so when cool. I say it's foldable. That would be so cool. I would love that. Yeah. Like having yeah, a yeah. rolling phone. Oh my gosh. Yes. I mean, TCL did a did a version of one. They never actually released it, but it was yeah. really awesome to see. Really <laughs> awesome. I bet okay, we're going to see it again at CES too. So yeah, I, yeah. I hope we do. I think we will. I have no insider no- knowledge, but I hope it happens. So my last prediction, of course, because I had to do a security and privacy one, is log for shell which is the exploit we've been hearing nonstop about for the past week. I feel so bad for all my InfoSec friends. This will lead to several data dumps and leaks in 2022 from vulnerable servers that attackers were actively targeting before the patches became available. And the unfortunate side of this is that we recently learned that you have to patch the patch because the patch also had a vulnerability in it. So like it just keeps getting worse and worse. So I 100% think that we are going to see some kind of leaks happen either on hacker forums or somebody will stick paste bins up online of of data that was available on these servers that were potentially vulnerable that were not being protected correctly. Either we we will see like plain text information that's posted, we'll see unencrypted data, we'll see things that are easily uh, decrypted, whatever it might be. And I think that's going to be a big problem in the next year. I'm going to put this in the class of Stephanie's AWS and say, I hope you're wrong. That doesn't mean I think you will be wrong. I hope I'm wrong too. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and you know what this will show, this will show who had good perimeter, who had good decentralized security, who knew that yes. security doesn't end at the perimeter because this makes log for shelf. People don't know, makes it super easy to get inside if it's not patched yes. and it's, hard to patch. It's a multi-layer patch. So it's, you know, it's, it's costly and time consuming to patch. So yeah, uh, uh, I hate to say it, but yeah, I think you're, you're probably going to be right about that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's my turn on the block. I'm going to go with hear them, Tom. My first one. We've been talking a lot about NFTs and cryptocurrencies and decentralized, uh, things. I think 
decentralized identity projects are going to get some momentum. Maybe maybe not quite go mainstream, but we're going to start to know about them, whereas most people don't know about them. These are things like MIT Solid, uh, Tim Berners-Lee's InRept, which uses Solid to say, let's take that blockchain idea. Let's take that decentralized, really hard to, to change, not one place, but you're in control idea and apply it to identity management. Uh, there's so much attention on privacy and control of your own personal data. Now is the time for one of these projects, whether it's Inrupt or something else, to, to start to get some traction and get companies to adopt it. Because that's that it's a chicken and egg problem. You need a company to adopt it for it to get that traction. And I think we're finally going to see, I don't know, maybe it'll be a Twitter, maybe it'll be a Square, or maybe it'll be something else. But somebody get on board and start giving one of these some momentum. I I mean, you know, that was going to be my first question. Like, who's first? Mm. I think it might be Square. Yep. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I mean Jack I, does I, love I, a decentralized process, doesn't he? He sure does. <laughs> and now that he doesn't have to worry about Twitter anymore, you know, he can, he can, I think that he's solely this is, focused on that, I think. I, yeah, right. I think, I think, you know, all kidding aside, this is actually something that will be very helpful to a lot of people and only a few select companies are able to do so. And I, 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 I would, I would guess square would be the company to do it. I mean, we mean block, of course. Block. When we say square. Oh yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Gosh. <laughs> uh, Unless they lose the H and R block and have to go back. To <laughs> right. Yes. Block. Does this get us closer to online voting? If, if, in my understanding mm -hmm. what you're talking about, I mean, that's a step correctly. or two down the road, but it might, yeah. right? Because because one of the issues with online voting is is being able to securely make sure like right. this vote was done once by one person and yeah. anonymous, right? like getting both of those. But if you get the identity tracking down, then it that's one more step uh, that makes it easier. So yeah, maybe. Then you I just got to figure out how to, de how to dissociate the vote from the identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so, but yeah, I, and I think, uh, I think there'll be a lot of pressure on meta to apply this, uh, to them. And I don't think they'll give in to it. Oh, they'll gosh. be the last ones That's on board. That's going to go great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. My second prediction, uh, is that the interoperable smart home, uh, system matter, uh, is going to go into effect in June. That's when it's scheduled. Uh, it's already been delayed once. I'm gonna I'm gonna predict it won't get delayed again. That's that's not really my prediction though. I think it will have once it goes into place, a measurable boost on smart home adoption. Uh, they're, they're, they've got Apple, Google, Amazon, Samsung, LG. Like they've got a lot of people. Zigbee's on board. Uh, behind this, and they're all vested in making people aware of it uh, and letting people know, hey, when you go into shop, if you see a light bulb that says matter compliant, it'll work. You don't have to guess anymore. It'll work. You got an Amazon, you got a Google Home, you got a HomePod Mini, it'll work. And I think suddenly, as, as soon as that's shown to be true, because I think there's a lot of skepticism of whether it will really work or not, and you know, there's still a chance it might not work as well as expected, but assuming it works and it's shown to be true, I think suddenly a lot of people were like, oh, okay, so I don't have to, I don't have to figure out a mess anymore. I can just buy a light bulb, I can buy a light switch, great. Uh, and I think that boosts adoption. I mean, you still have to run that smart bulb. You have to, you have to help it be smart through some sort of app, you know, or platform. But I do, I, I, I know a lot of folks who, cause I have, I have a smart home upstairs. That's real weird, you know, but it makes sense <laughs> to me, you know, and everyone's like, Oh my gosh, like, how do you even do this? And it's very much a daisy chain of all sorts of stuff. Like certain companies don't work with other companies all that well, blah, blah, blah. This, this, this is the promise of all of that going away. But, you know, Tom, let's say, you know, let's say it's your mom, you know, she buys her first smart bulb. Is this going to be easy for her? Yeah, it, it should be right. It should be like, OK, you, you can control it with your phone. You've got a phone, right? Like, and, and if you don't have a smartphone, then we're talking about a whole different classification. But my mom has a smartphone, so you've got a phone, you can control it. Uh, do you want to have control of multiple items on a platform? 
you you just need a uh, a hub, and the hub could be a hub, or it could be an Amazon Echo. Oh, you already have one of those. Oh, it could be a HomePod Mini. Oh, you already have one. It, it's just going to make it so much simpler. Routers will be able to act as hubs in this situation. So it's likely that a lot of people will already have the thing they need. And and so yeah, I think I think it will start to pass that test. This will be interesting because I don't currently use any smart home anything like Mm -hmm. the internet of things does not exist in my home (laughs) primarily because of security and privacy so Mm -hmm. if if this helps mitigate some of that i could see you know slowly but surely integrating um some things into you know my day-to-day life so that that this is really this is very interesting very exciting that's one of the most attractive things about thread running on matter is that it runs offline you don't, it can still, you can still turn your, your, your uh, lights on and off with your app over your home network. It doesn't ever need to go out on the internet. So privacy right. and security, you know, by design. Now you'll have to make sure where you will have to do investigation is, am I buying from a reputable device maker and all that, all right. of that still applies obviously. But, but yeah. yeah, if they're, if they're compliant, then yeah, you should have all the controls you need, which is good. Shannon, I'm curious how you feel on a you know security basis about matter. Um, you know, do you have any thoughts on the smart home and and what companies need to do differently than what they're doing now? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now we have a lot of vulnerabilities when it comes to just uh, the user operability. Uh, for example educating people about how important it is to use two-factor authentication on their on their home cameras so that people aren't logging in and watching their kids and stuff like that. So if there is a way to set up matter, especially with thread implemented, so that you know none of that data could be potentially uh, accessed by an attacker online, then absolutely I'm all for it. I mean, right now I have a Google Home in my household and I realize that that comes with some vulnerabilities just based on the privacy that matters that come with there. Uh, not this matter specifically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, different matter. <laughs> privacy matters. matters. <laughs> privacy matters. So I've set it up with that in mind where I use like completely separate accounts that aren't tied to my email address, for example. So that way, if Google is tracking everything that happens on the home device, it's not necessarily matching that up with my email account unless it's looking specifically at ISPs. And then I have a bunch of other stuff going on too. Um, but that's probably way too much for a regular user. So I'm really looking forward to Matter. I'm really looking forward to educating myself more about Matter to see if this is something that I could maybe sell off my old devices and switch over to new devices that do work with this protocol uh, to better protect myself and my family. Yep. And some of your old devices may be Matter compliant because they they can take Zigbee Mm -hmm. and, and upgrade it. So you might not even have to get rid of that many of them. Might have to get rid of a few, but yeah. All right. My last prediction is going to go in the opposite direction, I think, of uh, of Stephanie and Shannon, where they made predictions that'll probably be true that we hope maybe aren't true. I'm going to make one that maybe won't be true, <laughs> but I'm going to hope. I'm going to give it. They're going to give the prediction with the hope that it will be true, which is the chip shortage will end. By the end of 2022. Oh, Tom, keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Oh. Yeah, that, yeah. Oh. Somebody's got to be optimistic. They say you've got to put it out that into the universe. Wishful, yeah. Yeah. And and that is some it's wishful good thinking. Good mojo. Good mojo. <laughs> it's a high risk, high reward prediction. You're, you're manifesting. <laughs> You're manifesting it right now. Exactly. You're speaking exactly. It into exactly. Existence. You get potentially yeah. a low existence. Reward. Uh, ain't gonna happen but well, but listen, yeah let me optimistic <laughs> let's talk about this tom why i mean wh- why do you feel so bullish on the chip short is ending so the way it could end is that uh it, it requires a, a few other things to happen right it requires that the logistics uh issues start to get straightened out that we start to to realize the new rhythms of global commerce which probably requires if not the pandemic to end i don't think we're i think that might be asking too much but like we get into a predictable pattern with it where we're like okay we know how to deal with it we we can keep it from disrupting things as much if that happens then fabrication plants start to get on a new schedule people maybe stop hoarding the way you know People stopped hoarding toilet paper at some point. They stopped hoarding the chips at some point. Uh, and I think 
I think it's possible if everything goes right, and that's a big if, I get that, but if everything goes right on those things, then by the end of 2022, right, the, by Q4 2022, you may be seeing uh, chip makers saying, all right, we are meeting orders in a, in a normal time frame, and, it, and we are projecting in our 2023 earnings that we won't be suffering from the shortage the way we have the entire, because I think we're going to keep seeing that in the earnings reports for the first two, probably three quarters uh, of 2022. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, you say so, buddy. Nice you got to no. believe. I mean, you, you, you make a very strong <laughs> case Just for it. Um, but but again, there are a lot of things that have to happen, yeah. you know, in, in, a, in a certain order, at a certain time, all together. Um, that, that's just that, you know, if, if I was a betting, if I was a betting person, that, that would be way too many variables for me to, to take would, that thing. What I, what I would, I'd be really curious about is Tom, I think you're right that chip shortage in certain sectors is going to be pretty much fine by mm -hmm. the end of this time next year. Not all sectors though. And yeah. what sectors w will the, there be? Is it still going to be, you know, the automotive market that's just like crumbling you know, and people paying so much for used cars that they shouldn't pay for because there just is, you know, a dearth of of, mm -hmm. of vehicles in general. Uh, were you know, is it build your own PCs? You know, what what will it still be an issue at this time next year? Yeah, I th and I, I think that's that's the gamble here, right? Is that the chip shortage? probably will end by the end of 2023. Like, I, I, I think we'll, we, we could all probably say like, oh yeah, that seems reasonable. Whether it will make it by the end of 2022 is, is, is certainly pushing it. Uh, and maybe you'll give me partial credit if <laughs> chip shortage has ended in several well, sectors. Well, that's why I'm like it, it, explicitly, which, which sectors, Tom? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so See, I if, I, if I put that down, then I get credit, no credit. You, you know? get you partial gotta, credit. I know how to play this game. I got I to keep it vague. Oh, boy. Uh, but that's it. That's what I got. So uh, thanks, everybody, for for sharing your predictions uh, with us. I, this is a great, fun discussion and uh, pretty enlightening. I, I hope it gave everybody kind of a, a good view going into 2022. Indeed. Um, we want to thank our panel, Stephanie Humphrey, Nika Monford, and Shannon Morris. Uh, Stephanie, we'll start with you. Where can people keep up with your work? You can find me all around the web at Tech Life Steph. You can check out my podcast, The Tech John, at thetechjohn.com, J-A-W-N. Um, and you can check out tilldeftyoutweet.com as well. Excellent. Nika Monford, always a pleasure to have you on the show. And thanks for your predictions as well. Where can people keep up with the rest of what you do? On all of the social media outlets, I am Tech Savvy Diva everywhere. You can also check me out at Snobble Westcast. That is an Apple-centric podcast. You can also check us out at snobblewestcast.com. Beautiful. Shannon Morris, always, always a pleasure to have you on the show. You are a busy woman, so let folks know where they can keep up with what you do. Always. Uh, Twitter.com slash snubs, S-N-U-B-S, if you want to follow my hot takes over on the Twitterverse. And uh, you can find me on YouTube, youtube.com slash Shannon Morse. I actually invited on several different tech YouTubers, some of which are friends of DTNS right here, including um, maybe a Mr. Ayaz Akhtar. He's, he's oh, joining me on my own little prediction him. show. Oh. Yeah, so you can check out a few tech predictions over there, over on my YouTube channel. Well, we appreciate all three of you for being on the show with us. Uh, the prediction show is always a lot of fun. Uh, we also want to thank everybody that helped support the show because we couldn't do it without you. You can support our show at any level, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon if you need a little bit more information about that. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. You can always find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. That is it, y'all, for DTNS 2021. We are off tomorrow for New Year's Day, but we'll be back Tuesday in the new year with CES coverage starting January 4th. Folks, no one should have to spend New Year's Eve alone. Every year, Ritual Misery presents the Diamond Club New Year's Eve Streamathon, 27 hours of raising money for sick kids through extralife.org. This year, Sarah and myself will be bringing in the new year with a live show as part of that streamathon. Join us on New Year's Eve, uh, if you haven't missed it, at 2330 UTC, 1530 Pacific for Good Year Internet. 
Find all the details, including the full schedule at ritualmisery.com slash streamathon. Woo-woo! For the last time this year, this week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Strathalino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Associate producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S1, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's shows included Patrick Norton, Lamar Wilson, Rob Dunwood, Scott Johnson, and Shannon Morse. Guests on this week's shows included Norm Fazekas, Steve Iadarola, Stephanie Humphrey, and Nika Monfort. And thanks to all our patrons who make the shows possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>